Hi everyone, I'm Trish Triampho Sullivan, and I'm going to be talking today about my very favorite subject, the history and her story of photography, because women do pay, play an important role in the history of photography. So I'm sure everyone will be glad to know that. So this is lecture number 32 for Introduction to Photography. And like I said, it's my favorite topic because it has everything um, that a good story has, right? There's suspense, there's conflict, pretty much everything that you would see on a good movie. So let's, uh, let's get started on this right away. His and her story of photography. So it all starts with this guy, William Henry Fox Talbot. Okay, this guy, Fox Talbot, um, he invented something that he called a calotype. So the calotype um, was kalos, was from the Greek word um, kalos, which is beautiful. Okay. And typos. Greek word for impression. Okay, so this, he invented this particular uh, process that he called a calotype. And it was, you know, um, it stands, like I said, for beautiful impression. Um, and his process was pretty interesting. It was a, uh, a negative and positive process, which is ex exactly the same film photography process that we have today. Um, his was a little different though because he used a paper negative. Um, so that we'll talk more about that later. Um, anyway, he invented this process and he, he liked it. He, was, he thought it was pretty cool. Um, but he wasn't completely satisfied with it, so he kept tinkering with it. He was kind of an inventor guy, and he did a lot of a, a lot of other stuff. But this was a, a a project or a a process that uh, people and scientists and artists around the world have been trying to solve this problem for a long, long time. And so he solved it, right? But he wasn't happy with the results, and because of that. Um, he kept tinkering with it, you know, and, and doing some other stuff. He actually um, published the very first book, okay, first book illustrated with photographs, okay. It was called, and I'm going to write it in a different color so you can see, whoops, it was called The Pencil of Nature. Okay, so the Pencil of Nature, and we'll, I'll show you some examples of that after, later on in the lecture. Um, but he did this amazing thing. He invented photography, right? So imagine his surprise um, when all of a sudden someone else comes on the scene and says that they invented photography. And it was this guy, his name was Daguerre. This is like not writing very well. Let's find one that does. Ah, there we go. So Daguerre was, a, so William Henry Fox Talbot was British, right? He's from the UK. Daguerre was French, and um, he, uh, he went before the Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1839, right? and he said that he invented photography. Now, he did invent a process that took, photo that took images, right? but it's not photography as we know it today. 
and he called his invention a heliograph. The heliograph was from the Greek, once again, right? Which means sun, okay? And graphos which means drawing. Right? So it was um, it was a sun drawing. Excuse me for just a sec. Never a dull moment in photography class, right? <laughs> so this is the fun of being uh, sheltering in place. So we have uh, trying to do a lecture and record it and someone's banging at the door to deliver a package. So um, thank you very much for your patience while I ran and did that. So let's get back to Daguerre. So he invented, um, well, he went before the Academy of Arts and Sciences in France um, in 1939 and announced that he had invented a process photographic process that he called a heliograph. Helios for sun, graphos for drawing. So sun drawing, right? Now, you can imagine that William Henry Fox Talbot was pretty angry. He's like, I invented photography. I did it. Um, and, and actually, when we talk about it later, you'll see why he, his process was really the, the main one. But Daguerre went before um, the Academy and announced this, and his, um, his uh, process became incredibly popular, right? But he was kind of a dog, right? So let's, let's, let's talk about this guy for just a sec. So he didn't really invent this process. His partner, by, a guy by the name of Neps, and let me write it on here, guy by the name of Neps actually did the invention. Um, and he, uh, I think he took the, the first photograph, um, oh gosh, when was that? It was, it was uh, circa 1929, or 1829. Pretty sure it was like right in that area. I'm gonna have to look it up. Maybe it was 26. Anyway, it's not completely important as to ex the exact date that the first photograph was taken. Um, what is important is, is that Neps invented this process and he worked on it for many years. And then he took on a partner by the name of Daguerre, right? So this is Daguerre. Um, and Neps unfortunately croaked. He died in 1833. Right. So he died, 1833. And Daguerre went ahead and kept continuing on with the process and basically claimed it as his own, right? He didn't really give credit to Neps for any of the work that he did. Um, he gave credit to himself, right? So he announced this, but he wasn't really the inventor. He was the partner of the inventor, okay? And, uh, and so this is one of those little kind of stories that you're like, okay, here's the backstabbing son of a gun that uh, went in and kind of to stole the glory from William Henry Fox Talbot at this time in 1839, okay? So, and at this time, I have to say that there was a big dilemma in art, right? Um, painters and, and sculptors thought, you know, art is dead. Like, who's gonna buy a painting or a sculpture if they can take a photograph, right? Wouldn't that be better? Um, so, they were pretty angry. They were pretty pissed off about the whole thing. And they really thought that, um, that this would be 
uh, something that would destroy art, that art would be dead. We wouldn't have art anymore. Um, and the, uh, the daguerre, the, the, this process here became known as a daguerreotype. Let me erase this stuff, and I'm just going to write that down really quick because this is an important part of the, of the story here. So it ended up being called a daguerreotype. And it was a pretty interesting process, which had a very long time um, of, as a shutter speed. Now, the original, the first photograph, take a guess of what the shutter speed was. How long the exposure had to be, right? Think about how long. It was very long. Was it an hour? Two hours? Six hours? Twelve hours? Eight hours for the first exposure, that, that circa 1926 exposure. Eight hours. So this was a process that had long exposure times. And by the time it became mainstream, by the time when he announced it, and people all around the world wanted to have their portrait done with a daguerreotype, they wanted a daguerreotype, um, the, uh, the time, the exposure time was about 20 minutes. So if you see those old photos where the people look like they're really stiff and their, their eyes are like this, that's because they're trying to keep perfectly still and keep their eyes open for 20 minutes, right? <laughs> so, um, the original daguerreotype, yeah, 20 minutes. And they finally got the time down to, you know, like five minutes. Right? And this was um, uh, often silver plated on copper, okay? Um, but a lot of times you had the glass. It was done on glass. And um, so you have a five-minute time that you have to stay still. Uh, they had to do something that would make that that would make that work, right? How does pe how do we get people to hold still? So the photo nerds, you know, with a five minute exposure time, right? A five minute exposure. That's pretty. That's pretty long. Um, so the photo nerds came up with a device that they could use to make sure people held still, and so they invented this this uh, chair. And it had, well, of course, it had legs. <laughs> um, but it had like these, this little head rest with screws that they screwed into the kind of the back of the back side of your head to keep your head still. Okay. Talk about painful, right? Imagine having some like kind of bolts sticking into your head like Frankenstein, right? They also had some little things to hold your arms and legs in place. Right. What does that look like? Right. Kind of like a torture chair, or electric chair or something, right? It looks like it's a painful device. And it was something that, uh, that they had to, that they, the photo nerds did because they couldn't figure out how to get people to hold still, okay? So the next, you know, they're kind of strapped down, very painful. Um, and so when people, when you see those old photographs where people look kind of crazy or startled, that's because they were probably sitting in one of these, right? Um, but it doesn't look too good. So the daguerreotype was incredibly popular. Studios popped up all around the world, and people paid, lined up to get their portrait taken. And of course, like I said, artists were a little bit angry about that. So in comes this guy, um, William Octavius Hill. Okay, so Hill was a portrait painter, and um, he actually kind of fixed this dilemma that we had that we had with the with having to use the chair of torture to take photographs, because as a portrait painter, he had to do one thing to make sure that he could have um, his subjects uh, to be able for him to be able to paint his subjects, and that was guess what? He had to have them sit still for a very long time. 
So he understood how to pose people in a more relaxed manner that allowed them to sit for their photograph without looking crazed or startled, okay? So, um, so he had this, this you know, knack that was, he was able to use from his professional career as a portrait painter. And back then, I have to say that people, uh, that was really common. Before photography, they literally had portrait painters that would travel around from, from town to town, and that's all they did was paint portraits. In other words, if you wanted to give a likeness of yourself to your sweetheart, right, you would have, you would hire a portrait painter to paint a little miniature that they could carry with them, like a little, you know, locket size or pocket watch size that they could carry with them. Um, and if you wanted more than one, you'd have to have more than one painted, right? Um, if you had a lot of sweethearts. <laughs> So, and that was the way that people um, uh, would, would uh, document their family. So they would have a portrait painted of their family or a, a husband might paint a, get a uh, commission a portrait for his, of his wife or his children, right? Maybe not the whole family, but at least part of the family, okay? So they would do that. Um, and that was one of the things that, you know, you know, William Octavius Hill was a professional portrait painter. So he basically traveled from town to town in the northeastern part of the United States and painted portraits. So he had the knack, he had the, the, the trick of getting people to hold still for long periods of time while their portraits were taken. So he partnered up with a chemist, because remember, photography took a lot of chemicals and a lot of work, um, by the name of Adamson. And he changed photography by allowing people to sit for a portrait, for a daguerreotype portrait, um, comfortably. So you'll see, you see a change in the photographs at, at that time where people look more relaxed and comfortable, and that's why, right? Because they're not in the chair of torture anymore. Um, so the next important, uh, the next really important person in photography is a guy by the name of Nadar. Right? So Nadar was the very first celebrity photographer. Right? The very first um, paparazzi. He was the very first guy to do to do this, and he had this great idea. Um, he thought, and he only had one name. Okay, so he's he uh, uh, he went by Nadar, right? Just like maybe Cher or Madonna or Prince, or the, or the artist formerly known as Prince, right? So um, he just had that one uh, uh, name, nom de plume, so to speak. <laughs> And he thought people might want to have photographs of famous, of other famous people, of people that were famous in the world at the time. So he had this idea that he would create some photographs of, of famous people, right? Um, which is kind of exciting. He thought might want that. And so at the time, the most famous person in the world, in the entire world, um, was a stage actress by the name of Sarah Barnhart, right? So Sarah Barnhart was, um, uh, was very famous on the stage. She traveled the world and, for productions and stuff. And, and um, Nadar contacted her and at, said that he'd like to take her photograph, right? And she knew who he was. He's, you know, well-known photographer at the time. Um, so she agreed to come over to his studio. And what, what happened was, is uh, she, was, she ended up coming dressed as a character for the play. Now, if you've ever seen theater or seen someone dressed up for theater, their makeup is really thick and almost clown-like when you get close up to them, right? So he sees her and he says, well, I don't want to photograph the character you're playing in the play. I want to photograph you. She says, nobody wants to see me. They want to see the character I'm playing on the, on the stage right now. And so he finally convinced her that he wanted to, to photograph her as a person, as the actress, not as the character in the play. So he convinces her to, she had an elaborate wig, he convinced her to take this wig off and kind of, you know, comb her hair out a little bit, um, remove the really thick stage makeup, 
take off this elaborate costume and he kind of wrapped her like in a sheet, right? Like, <laughs> like a Greek, you know, toga or something. Um, and uh, or, or it was like, I think actually it was curtains. I think he actually draped her in some curtains. And this became the most famous photograph of the time. And Nadar had it right. People not only wanted photographs of, of a famous person or famous people, but they were willing to pay for it. So that was kind of a big deal. Join me for part two.